So uh, the uh, I made a commitment that uh, from from what I deliver at the end of the week, if it's if it's possible to do that, that uh, there can be some time for stakeholders to have a look at that, give some feedback. It's not going to be. It's not going to be a long consultation. Okay. But, thank uh, you. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. The Honourable um, <laughs> Member for uh, Cape Breton South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last Thursday, the Minister provided inaccurate information when answering a question on Holy Angel School. And I'd like to clarify some of the minister's comments. But first, I'd like to thank the minister for her apologizing to the House on the matter of uh, authority for purchase of schools. And now that we've established that the government can purchase Holy Angels, my question to the minister, what is the asking price of the school? The Honourable Minister of Education. I, I actually do know the asking price, but I'm, I'm not sure in my own mind if that's confidential information. Um, so I'll just say that um, I believe it's close to 800000 for the, as a purchase price. Okay. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton South and your first supplementary. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, the ask, acting price, or the, the price that's been asked for the school is $750,000. And I would suggest that that, that uh, number is probably open for negotiation. Not a great deal of money concerning, concerning the uh, school uh, purchase, uh, in considering what might happen to that school if it's not purchased. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the minister claimed her department would need to invest $10 million in the school. And Mr. Speaker, the sources that I've been talking to say that the school is in reasonably good shape, and the issue about uh, renovations needed hasn't really been a question until this whole matter of closure uh, rose with the school board last week. And of course, as we all know, that any school, any high school, will need renovations over the long term. This would be this would be something that the government uh, wouldn't have to put in the school board's budget immediately, but over a period of years to bring the school up to standards in the same way that Sydney Academy in my area and, and the area of Cape Breton Nova and, Holy, and, uh, and uh, the school in Cox Seat, Riverview High, is being renovated. So this will be no different than that. My question to the minister, can the minister please explain the $10 million investment she claims is necessary? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, the board has only provided a range of between eight and ten million dollars, as um, over the next number of years, as the uh, the possible amount that would be needed to upgrade that building to make it a modern uh, educational facility. And uh, that uh, range of figures was given to us and apparently was provided to the board by um, a committee that they set up in the early days when they found out that the, uh, the congregation of the Sisters of Notre Dame were going to, uh, to sell uh, the complex. So those are the board's figures and I, I've only been given that broad range. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton South and your final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've heard the Minister state that it could be $10 million. The only time I've heard the $10 million figures from the Minister. I haven't heard it from anybody else. Uh, and the Board will not, uh, will not confirm that figure with me or anybody else that's asked them at the present time. Uh, it seems to me that this is a good idea for the Department of Education to save some money, probably on instructions from the Minister of Finance. If that school, if you can get rid of that school, get rid of it. But let's not spend any more money on the, on the uh, board. My final supplementary, Mr. Speaker, I hope the Minister would agree with me that Holy Angels High School is indeed a, a unique learning experience and providing excellent educational opportunities for young women. And will the Minister commit to find a way to have Holy Angels continue with its mandate, and that is to provide proven quality education like they've been doing since 1885 in the Sydney area. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I certainly agree with the Honourable Member that uh, Holy Angels has a, a very rich history and does a wonderful job of educating uh, young women. Um, 
That is why um, senior staff with the uh, Department of Education has committed and continues to work with the staff of the school board to, uh, to investigate what options are available to continue that school in whatever setting uh, might be appropriate as chosen by the school board. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Health. In the mid-July edition of the Victoria Standard, it was reported that Highland Manor Neils Harbour would not have its operating license renewed unless there was a commitment in writing from the Department of Health to repair deficiencies identified in the Fire Marshal's office. In an August 13th visit to the Manor, the Minister's deputy assured residents the home would not be closing. Since that day, a few minor issues from the Fire Marshal's report have been addressed, but critical issues such as space for a common room being limited to 10, a spot, Mr. Speaker, where church services are held, have not been addressed. My question through you to the Minister is this. What is your government doing to address both the immediate and long-term concerns and challenges facing Highland Manor? The Honourable Minister of Health. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Um, Mr. Speaker, all of our homes for special care are very important to, uh, to us because they provide services to the people we care most about in our province, and that's our seniors, Mr. Speaker, and the residents of Highland Manor are certainly no different. Um, this is why when the fire marshal had concerns about the uh, health and safety um, for residents, uh, my department was involved, my deputy minister um, took time and, and met with the uh, residents and with uh, members of the board and staff in that facility. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work with the administration and uh, the board of that uh, facility as well as the district health um, authority um, to ensure that uh, there are good quality standards for the residents of that facility. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes and your first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the NDP government committed in the spring of 2009 to provide more restorative care to address mobility concerns and medication issues for seniors. Now the seniors in Neils Harbour are being held hostage. You have delayed expansion for the Nikhil Home for Special Care in my Honourable House Leader's constituency of Argyle and you cut back on a 22-bed residential facility in the western part of southern and Cumberland County. You've also cancelled six additional beds for homes in Parsborough and Advocate Harbour. My question to order, the Minister... Order, order. The time for oral question period has expired. The uh, Honourable Government House Leader. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could you please call bills for second reading? Before we go to bills for second reading, I forgot I'm going to recognize the Honourable Member for Hans West on an introduction. Uh, the Honourable Member for Hans West. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the uh, Deputy Government Host Leader for the uh, opportunity. Just want to introduce today a couple of constituents uh, from uh, my constituency of Hans West are here with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Pat Post, who is Executive Director, and she's making her way across the gallery there now. Uh, for the Windsor Daycare Center and my wife Leslie Porter. Good to have them both in the crowd this afternoon. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, bills for second reading, could you please call Bill 76, the Credit Union Act? Bills for second reading, Bill 76, the Credit Union Act. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise as Minister responsible for the Credit Union Act to move second reading of some very important amendments to the credit union system, not only in Nova Scotia, but throughout Atlantic Canada. And I join all members of the House in marking the extent to which we value credit unions in our province and in our communities, credit union members and the role they play in our provincial economy. Credit union partnerships with the province, and I note in particular, Mr. Speaker, the Small Business Loan Program, are working to create and maintain thousands of jobs across the province. And I'm pleased that very recently our government announced an expansion of that very successful program in partnership 
with our credit unions. All members of the House understand the importance of ensuring that the credit union system is as efficient and as strong as it can be in order to serve its members as best that it can. Because these customer-owned financial institutions support families and help to grow our economy through their support for small business and in the many ways that they support community development. Now, Mr. Speaker, the banks of our country are regulated federally, but credit unions are regulated provincially. The province, in association with the Credit Union Deposit Insurance Corporation, known as CUDIC, C-U-D-I-C, is the primary regulator of the credit union system and ensures the prudent management of the Nova Scotia credit union system. And Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to say that the credit union system in Nova Scotia today is strong and financially healthy. Et si vous me permettez, Monsieur le Président, j'aimerais ajouter quelques mots en français, parce que le système des caisses populaires est une partie intégrale de nos communautés acadiennes, notamment dans la communauté de Chetican, où le mouvement coopératif et le mouvement des caisses populaires est une partie de l'histoire de cette communauté, forte et prospère, parce que c'était une façon dans laquelle le peuple de Chetican en peut saisir dans leurs propres mains leur avenir, leur avenir et, et, et le, les fruits de leurs travaux. Et je peux souligner aussi, par exemple, la contribution qui est faite chaque jour dans la communauté de la baie sainte marie où le système des caisses populaires est très fort Et en parlant euh, plus tôt aujourd'hui avec le député de Clare, il m'a indiqué qu'il y a plus de succursales des caisses populaires dans sa région qu'il y a des succursales des banques commerciales. C'est une la caisse populaire de Clare est une partie très très importante de l'économie de la baie Sainte Marie. Mr. Speaker, these amendments represent a system-wide change which provides member credit unions in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island with the benefits of a larger, more diverse, and more cost-effective trade association. And something, Mr. Speaker, that a lot of people here in Nova Scotia don't realize is that we already have essentially a merged system between our credit unions and those in Newfoundland and Labrador. And what this legislation will allow us to do is to join with our sister provinces in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island to have a truly Atlantic Canada-wide credit union system. These amendments were arrived at after extensive consultation with the member credit unions. These changes, if approved by this House, will enable Credit Union, of Central, credit union Central of Nova Scotia to acquire the assets of New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island Central, accept New Brunswick and PEI credit unions as members, and provide services to these credit unions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for those who are unfamiliar with the system, Credit Union Central of Nova Scotia is an umbrella organization that provides financial services and trade association services to local credit unions, and under the existing law, every credit union in Nova Scotia is required to be a member of the Credit Union Central. The Central is a link to the national and international credit union network for our local credit unions. So, Mr. Speaker, to mark the expansion of the system from one that covers Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador to one that covers the entire Atlantic region, these amendments would change the name of Credit Union Central of Nova Scotia to Atlantic Central. This significant initiative, as I said, Mr. Speaker, is the fruit of uh, at least a couple of years' work between the government and the credit unions. And it is important to underline, Mr. Speaker, that the initiative has been brought forward by the credit unions themselves. This is something that they want in order to be stronger and to continue to serve their members and their communities well into the future. 
I'm pleased to note, Mr. Speaker, that New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, the governments of those provinces, are on board with this work. We are working collabor collaboratively together, and in order to make this system change, it will require similar legislation to be passed in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. And if all goes well, Mr. Speaker, we are hopeful that the mirror legislation in those two provinces will be passed by their legislatures this fall so that the, so that the deal can close effective January 1, 2011. If for any reason the legislation either here or in the other provinces did not pass according to that schedule, then we just hope to move forward with all deliberate speed in order that the strengthening of the credit union system can take place as soon as possible. The goal, as I said, Mr. Speaker, is to realize greater efficiencies and greater specialization in services. The combined Atlantic Central will service 63 credit unions, 340,000 members with combined assets of three and a half billion dollars. So, Mr. Speaker, not only does this improve and strengthen our credit union system, but it is just another contribution to growing our economy for the long term. I look forward to the comments of other members of the House on this important initiative and will certainly take into account any suggestions or observations that they may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Sure. Speaker. Thank, thank you, Minister. I'll now recognize the Honourable Member for King's West. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, pleased today to uh, uh, speak on Bill 76. And uh, just to just to kind of go back and take a look at the uh, at the beginnings, the genesis of this particular uh, bill, because uh, these these amendments were brought forward uh, by the credit unions uh, themselves. And uh, as we know, Newfoundland and uh, Labrador has already been acquired by uh, Credit Union Central uh, of, uh, of Nova Scotia. So the, the bill essentially will allow Credit Union Central of Nova Scotia to acquire uh, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, uh, that is uh, New Brunswick Central and PEI Central. So Credit Union Central Atlantic, this new entity from the acquisition of NB and PEI by Nova Scotia to accept New Brunswick and PEI credit unions as members. The acquisition of these entities into one single entity will enable them to benefit from the economics of scale. Larger pooling of resources should mean greater services for members. I know there are members in this House uh, who are members of the credit union and, uh, and definitely benefit uh, from the, the kind of service uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the broad services that they offer in uh, many of their branches. Uh, the bill was already in the works, as we know, before the NDP took office. Bernie O'Neill, President and CEO of Credit Union Central of Nova Scotia, said in an answer to media questions on Monday, November 1st, uh, that it's been a process of over two years to put into place. Uh, the piece of legislation was nearly ready and identified uh, on the government's legislative agenda, uh, perhaps uh, as early as about two years ago. Both the New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island will have to pass mirror legislation for this to work. Newfoundland and Labrador have already addressed this uh, issue. All indications point uh, to these two provinces passing mirror legislation in the near future, although New Brunswick, having just changed governments, uh, we hope that it will be uh, reasonably high uh, on, their, on their agenda as they bring in uh, their legislative slate. The goal is to realize greater efficiencies, greater specialization in services for Atlantic Credit Union system. However, one of the services that Bernie O'Neill pointed to in a small scrum after the bill briefing on Monday, November 1st, was marketing. It would be good if marketing wasn't the only service that will be improved uh, by, uh, by this uh, merger. As we all know, this is a very, very uh, competitive business. Uh, the banks, of course, are, are always offering uh, a new array of services. So, so we certainly hope that it well, it, it will lead to, uh, down that path. Uh, so this is indeed a significant realignment, as the minister has pointed out, of how credit unions are organized uh, in Atlantic Canada. Uh, it's supposed to be aimed at the corporate and organizational level. And the effect on members should be 
and we hope increased services and hopefully that is the case. Combined Atlantic Central will serve as 63 credit unions, uh, nearly 350,000 members, combined assets of 3.5 billion. And uh, one of the services that uh, this member actually gets uh, from the credit union is the ability to actually rent from the credit union. So, uh, so that's probably possibly a little bit of a unique situation that this member uh, enjoys. So if uh, greater efficiencies uh, lead to a reduction in my rent, I'm sure that will also be happy for the Minister of Finance to hear as well. But there's a few questions that uh, do remain uh, around the bill, uh, because uh, Bernie O'Neill again in the media scrum said on Monday that this should not result in significant job uh, con consolidation. But, uh, but, but a question I think that we need to raise, and perhaps this will come out uh, in, in law amendments, uh, the, the economics of scale, of course, mean efficiencies, but efficiencies often do mean uh, sometimes fewer people. So, so we hope that this is not the case, and perhaps some uh, questions around that will come forward uh, in law amendments. Uh, so there, there could be some job relocation over time uh, was one of the other references uh, uh, that Bernie O'Neill uh, did, uh, did make. Uh, however, all credit union employees will be offered the chance to stay with the organization, just maybe not in their present location. So a question to, to raise would be the level of, uh, of uh, if there would be any impact on rural services. Uh, we, we all know that credit unions uh, have had a, a very significant uh, a central place in, in rural Nova Scotia, and uh, we would hope that uh, uh, everything would stay intact in, in that regard and that, uh, that this would not uh, impact any of the branches. So if there's job uh, relocation, does it follow that there could be uh, branches affected uh, by, by this uh, change? Uh, maybe not, we certainly hope not, and uh, uh, we as a, as a caucus look forward to uh, this bill going before law amendments and uh, uh, hearing uh, from uh, credit unions and others uh, who engage uh, uh, in the services of the credit union. And uh, with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, are the few words I have to say on uh, Bill 76. Thank you. Uh, I would now recognize the, uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Yarmouth on an introduction, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize Michael Vickers, President of the Young Liberal Association of St. Mary's, who's with us in the... West Gallery. Uh, Mr. Vickers, please rise and be recognized by this House. Thank you. Uh, I will now recognize the Honourable Member for Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This, this bill uh, re represents years of work by the credit unions. 30 years ago, there were 300 credit unions throughout Nova Scotia. Today, there are 35, mostly due to mergers. And for example, in the area that I represent, we have the East Coast Credit Union, where we have seven credit unions now forming one. And if, I look, if we look back into the area that I represent, um, the area that I represent owes a tremendous amount of credit to the credit unions. And the achievements that were made in communities were largely due to the works of people like Father Moses Cody and the clergy and the individuals he inspired to take a real interest in people. They saw credit unions as advisors and helpers to individual small business people like fishermen and woodlot owners and farmers and merchants. And as a result, Nova Scotians right around the province have come to realize that credit unions were their friends. They were there to help them achieve some degree of economic success for themselves and their communities. And Mr. Speaker, as Nova Scotians, we owe a tremendous amount to the credit union movement and the economic and social leadership within the credit union movement. Each province has a central credit union. And with the changes, they're going to have a larger, almost central bank. It's going to mean stronger, more efficient operations, and it's going to enable the credit union to compete with other financial institutions. And as we know, competition improves service and that is important for Nova Scotia consumers and Nova Scotia business. It helps to drive transaction costs down because there's economies of scale 
when you have provinces like New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia working together. And in Nova Scotia here, this province has 165,000 credit union members. Uh, one of the areas where it will help strengthen is in a, a smaller credit union, where perhaps, uh, let's say, if we took the area of, say, Yarmouth, where there might be a lot of loans outstanding to fishermen. Well, there's great dependence within that portfolio on the success of the fishery. So with expanded operations, those loan portfolios can be diversified with other areas of the province that might have a base in another sector of our economy. So with the credit union expanding into those other areas and partnering with other credit unions, uh, they're going to improve their operations. And Mr. Speaker, as everybody in this House knows, we are soon going to have a new member sitting in the legislature, the member for Cumberland South. And he will be our new leader, Jamie Bailey. And he, as president of the uh, CEO of the credit union, knows how hard the credit union has worked for communities and business people throughout our region. And we look forward to him joining us here in the House. And Mr. Speaker, we are supportive of this bill. And on closing, I would like to say that sometimes government can do things to help business and the economy without spending money. And this is just one of those times that government has a chance to do that. And that's another reason why we are supportive of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I will now recognize the Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd uh, like to stand and say a few words in support of uh, Bill 76, the Credit Union Bill, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, the idea that uh, the, uh, of amalgamating uh, credit unions throughout Atlantic Canada is a good re is is a very very positive move forward for our credit unions, uh, not just uh, for, for the mere fact that the the amount of strength it gives them, but it, it through that strength is a great deal of stability, and that if, if we've ever needed stability in our financial markets, Mr. Speaker, it's been realized in the last few years, uh, and especially when we look uh, south of, of of the border and and see what uh, had happened down there and with subprime loans and so on, Mr. Speaker, and what we need uh, to revitalize the financial sector and to have true respect and relevance to it is that it has to come uh, from a very base level, and that base level is the credit union movement, Mr. Speaker. You know, I'm very fortunate uh, in my constituency to have three credit unions, the New Waterford Credit Union, which is uh, the largest of the three, Dominion Credit Union, and the uh, Tompkins Credit Union in uh, reserve, which is part of Glace Bay Central, and uh, I, I think I want to spend just a few moments talking about, you know, uh, obviously when, when we, uh, just by the mere fact of, of when you introduce either the Tompkins or the Cody name in 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 the co-op or, or, or credit union movement, people recognize it right, right off the right off the bat, and and that was. The, the idea of the Tompkins Credit Union in, in reserve w w was, was a very uh, seminal moment in a lot of uh, the, the movement as it expanded, not just credit unions, but in, in, in Tompkinsville in, in reserve is the first cooperative housing development in all of Nova Scotia. I believe, and I, Mr. Speaker, I stand correct, in all of Canada. Now, Mr. Speaker, this was, this was uh, working women and men uh, primarily from uh, the coal mining industry, getting together, realizing that the stock of housing that existed in that area was old. Many of it was uh, up around official row and stuff that, like that area that were old company houses uh, built in and around the, uh, the, the uh, 19, early 1900s, Mr. Speaker. So these folks realized that we we have to do is we got to build uh, adequate housing uh, for ourselves and our families. And this was an extension. It came out of the, uh, the credit union movement, Mr. Speaker, and clearly uh, if, you, if, you have the, uh, if you have the pleasure to drive into reserve, there's a cairn right at the end of that road in, in, uh, uh, in uh, it's there in honor of the, the, uh, the, the committee that helped build that. And Mr. Speaker, these are people that have been honored throughout all of Canada. For, for what they've done. And these were, were visionaries, Mr. Speaker, and somewhat the people who have been involved with the, the, uh, 
the movement of this bill towards uh, towards passage is is they were visionaries, uh, Mr. Speaker, because they realize that to to again to to uh, accumulate as much capital as possible in in in, a, in an area that 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 that's uh, res responsible for that capital. It's not offshore. It's 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 home. It's homegrown and. Uh, we we, uh, we we applaud that vision uh, aspect of it, but Mr. Speaker, you know, uh, I talk about uh, the uh, Tompkins Credit Union Reserve and and then the Dominion Credit Union, Mr. Speaker. Again, it's it's a, it's a small town, but it's the, that's the only financial institution in that town has been for quite some years, as as long as I can recall, Mr. Speaker, and they this is a, is an institution that help many, many small businesses and, and families get their first start. And they were always there for people. And again, it's a matter of, 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 of uh, the, the, their base to grow from, uh, Speaker. And uh, you know, you can walk up and down, whether it's, it's Station Street, uh, Lingan Street, Corbett Street. There's a Corbett Street in, 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 in Dominion. And, uh, and Mr. Speaker, uh, they, uh, I don't think it's, it's probably somewhere. I guess might, they might be related to me, but they'll, they'll never admit to it in public. <laughs> but Mr. Speaker, that that, that uh, you can see homes that were that were were, were either built through uh, uh, financial help of the uh, credit union movement, or certainly that were were repaired and, and refurbished with money from Dominion Credit Union and and the leadership role they play in their community. Because you know uh, the. Uh, uh, I think I did a crossword puzzle this weekend, and one of the clues, and it was uh, where everyone knows your name. And I was going to put down Cheers, but there was too many, <laughs> there was too many words. But what it is, is it, the answer is actually small town. And I said, well, that's that, you know, that's then that, that's Dominion. It's a small town, and, and everyone knows your name, and that's how they like going in. And it's it's very congenial when you go in there. They 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 know they know you by name, and 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 they and you're not just a, a number in in. Uh, in in in, a, in, a, in in a somewhere in Toronto or something like that, you're you're relevant. You you, you get to meet and um, decide on the future of, of, of that financial institution as it relates to your communities. So I mean, uh, Dominion has been a leader in that. Again, Mr. Speaker, in my own community of uh, where I my credit union, uh, Nawad for Credit Union, uh, it, it was it was. Uh, it was similar to other small credit unions for quite some time because it was it was teetering on um, would, would it survive and and because what happened was people thought it had lost its relevance. People, you know, this was when banks started getting to mortgages and they began to, to loosen up lending and so on and and uh, so we uh, we thought you know there was fewer people involved and. Uh, uh, the uh, a man by the name of, of Lou Finder. He's from over the north side, Mr. Speaker. And Lou, Lou, they hired Lou as the uh, as, as the general manager. And, and uh, Lou said, "Look, we, we you know we've obviously got we're perilously close here uh, in in uh, what we have out in loans and what we have in savings. And this is not this is not a good situation." So what Lou did was was he he went out and he and he started the campaign, albeit. Uh, not a, a loud one, but he, he, he met uh, with the then mayor and council of New Waterford. Then he met with the, uh, the unions. Then he met with the churches and slow, told them and reminded them of their role in the community and, and what a loss it would be to have your credit union close on you. And how important that is for you to have control over your financial future. So Lou is retired now. I think he retired in about uh, 99, 2000, or 2000. But uh, he uh, he will be uh, long in, in, in many memories, Mr. Speaker, because of what he did. Be, because he he reinvigorated the local community to say this is where to go. This is this is where to go to 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 to, to drive investment in your community when you need it. And and it's not only the straight up do you, you know, whether you're looking for a, a car loan or or, or a um, a loan for a mortgage for a home or or just student uh, uh, financial aid, Mr. Speaker. What it's become 
through uh, Lou's pre uh, uh, Lou, Lou's successor in, in Bruce McDonald, is they've really involved themselves uh, as a leader in the community. And uh, it's not only giving back dividends, but Speaker, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the, the larger part of the community that some, some of these folks may not be members of that, that credit union who they helped directly. They, they, uh, they were the, the, the prime motivator for, for a few years and, and sponsor of Safe Grad. And I don't think there's a person in this uh, assembly uh, wouldn't applaud what Safe Grad has meant uh, for our young students graduating, and and, and their utmost safety is is uh, is kept in mind. I, I can only think of for years that you would see uh, graduation after graduation, and you would see at that time of year you would sadly pick up uh, newspaper or, or, or other forms of media about uh, incidents on prom night and so on, but. What uh, they did was they, they took the, uh, the safe grad idea, really cemented it, and, and what the real point of their leadership was, in my estimation, was, was, was to foster the growth, make it stable, and then hand it to, to an, uh, a committee, but on that committee is still many of, of the employees of, of the credit union, but that's what they've done. You know, it's, 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 it's so uh, in, in intricate to what the credit union movement is itself. It takes the, the local idea, grows it, then allows uh, it to uh, be passed on and, and to grow further. And so, you know, whether, you know, I have to think of some of the, the people that work there, like Pauline Ledbetter and, and, and Kathy McClellan and, and uh, Harvey LeBlanc. Harvey's a good friend of mine. Uh, he happens to live over around Florence, but uh, I like him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but Harvey Harvey's a great guy, and uh, you know, and and there was other people there. Betty Gillis there for for many years, and, and Marilyn White. All these folks, all from the community, Mr. Speaker, that and uh, you know, and Cheryl Wilcox. All these folks that uh, Cheryl and Joan, I should say now, that they uh, they were from the community, and they understood, uh, you know, what what this meant, and and. Uh, and how to treat people. Now, that's, you know, that's, I'm not denigrating uh, the, the banking system. That it works very well in this country, and, and that's fine. But it's really, I, 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 I don't make uh, any apologies, though, to say that uh, my support for the credit union movement, because uh, of, of, uh, it's, you know, it, it has that, that grassroots ability to help. Uh, the, the, the person there. It's, it doesn't have to doesn't have to need a, a loan that has to be vetted in Toronto. It, it can be vetted on the local level by people that are, are your neighbors, Mr. Speaker. But you know, and it's always fun if you have time to get in. And, and they, one of their uh, former offices they turn into like a, a small art gallery and allows local artisans to show. Uh, and have exhibitions there, Mr. Speaker, which is, I invite people to, to if you have time, to, to go see. Mr. Speaker, um, I, I uh, think of, a matter of fact, they're the major sponsor of the Junior C hockey team, even, Mr. Speaker. So they, they, they're, uh, they reach in, in, in many areas, and it's, it's so important that uh, when we're here today to, to, to debate Bill 76, it, uh, while, some people may say, well, are, you know, is this growth too much? And, and I don't think it is. I think, uh, matter of fact, I know it isn't, Mr. Speaker. It, what it is, it's, 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 it's the right growth at the right time. It's the reality, and, and many things, I think we could take a lead as, as uh, legislators in their ability. We often, there's often talk about the ability for us as the uh, four provinces of Atlantic Canada to, to do regulations together and so on. And I think they're showing us the way here, Mr. Speaker, and I think we should sit up and take notice. This is, uh, while uh, our government uh, uh, have sponsored this bill, this is a, this is a bill that's put forward and, and, and certainly been, been uh, mentored by the credit union movement. So it, it's to them that we owe the, 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 the responsibility to this bill. It's our pleasure as a government to bring it forward. So Mr. Speaker, uh, that we uh, as a government wholeheartedly support uh, obviously this bill 76, but more importantly, 
as a government, we want to say that we support the credit union movement and its importance in the economic development, uh, not only in my community, not only in the province of Nova Scotia, but throughout Atlantic Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will now recognize the honourable member for Picto East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure for me to rise in support of this bill. I think it's a, an outstanding bill, and I would like to commend the minister for bringing it forward. I, I, I know uh, it has been in the works for a period of time, but uh, this minister in the last year and a half has taken this forward to the House, and I commend him for that. And while I'm speaking about this minister, I say it repeatedly in my constituency. I say that in 20 years' time, people will look back on this minister as the greatest finance minister this province has ever seen. Mr. Speaker, Order, please. The honourable member for Picto East has the floor. Thank you. Speaker, I speak but the truth. <laughs> now, I want to tell you how long I have been a credit union member. I want you to listen to this for just a moment. You take the age, take the age of the member for Yarmouth. Take the age of the member for Hammonds Plains Upper Sackville and combine them, and that's about how long I have been a credit union member. I belong to the New Glasgow Credit Union when it was one or two rooms. It had some farmers, some fishermen, some coal miners, some steel workers, the, the, the farm families that couldn't get money anywhere else could get some money from the credit union. It was looking after some small businesses in Pictou County. It was a small credit union. It also had, as a member, a young news director, a very young news director at, uh, at that time as a member. <laughs> now, as the son of a coal miner, I grew up in a house that didn't have a great deal of money, and I've never had much family money over the years. But the credit union, the credit union yeah. took chances on me time and time again. I have, through the credit union, purchased three houses, I operated a business, and the fact I couldn't count the number of cars that I have had financed through the credit unions in this province. Now, after being involved with the credit union in New Glasgow, I got involved with the credit union in Adikanish. And the member for Antikanish knows how good that credit union is down there. The Burgeon Grin Credit Union is a great credit union. It is a credit union that has really supported the surrounding area. And I'm proud to say that the New Glasgow Credit Union is now associated with the Burgeon Grin Credit Union. So in... Uh, in uh, 1973, I became a member of the Province House Credit Union just across the street from us. You did. And I, I just want to use as an example, an example of what the credit union does for people. Now, before I say this, I want to say that I belong to the Westville Rotary Club, and the Bank of Nova Scotia is represented there. The Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, is represented there. They have great people, and uh, I have dealt with those banks uh, as well, but not like the, the credit union. 
since, since we on this side of the house cleaned up the expense, the operating expenses of MLAs, since we did that, since we cleaned up the, the first changes that have been made ever for transparency, for transparency and openness, and the, the only thing that perks anymore for the average MLA is, is coffee, and we did that. We did that. So here's the situation. I go across the street to the credit union today, and I say to them, can you get this service at a bank? Now just listen for a moment, without the heckling. Listen for a moment. I go over and I say, could I get a copy of check 472 for my expense account? Because in cleaning it up, as you know, as members, you also have to show that the check has actually cleared. So I go over to the credit union and they make a copy of the front of the check and the back of the check for me. Now, can you walk in to a bank and get that kind of service? Can you do that? Well, I'll tell you, the credit union system, the credit union system is one that I have used in at least seven counties. And when I lived in Cape Breton, the credit union was very important to me up there. And as the deputy premier was talking about Dominion and other places, I used to use that credit union in Sydney and all kinds of other places. Uh, Glace Bay, the member for Glace Bay, I used to be over there in that credit union a lot as well. So the credit union has been there for me in over a dozen communities, over a dozen communities. So I just want to say how important this is for the province of Nova Scotia, for Newfoundland and Labrador, for Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick to have a united credit union, an Atlantic-wide credit union system. And I'm very proud that our minister was the minister who brought that into the House. So I, I, I want to uh, not just talk about the bill, I want to talk about people. Sure. Because people are really important to me. And I go into the New Glasgow Credit Union quite often, and uh, in the New Glasgow Credit Union, there is a, 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 a young woman who started grade primary with uh, me. Her name was Sharon Wadden, she's now Sharon Martin, and uh, it's a great pleasure to walk into a credit union and see a person still working who, in fact, start at grade primary with you. And that's the kind of service, that's the kind of service I get in the credit union. When you walk in the door, there's a recognition. There's a recognition. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there is another person that I want to mention who works in that credit union in New Glasgow. And her name is Glenda Frazier. And Glenda Frazier drives in to New Glasgow all the way from the Garden of Eden. And only a constituency like Picto East could have a community called the Garden of Eden. I mean, that, that constituency, I, I, I say, I say to the member for Picto West, the Speaker of the House, I say to him, the sun rises in Picto East and it sets in Picto West. And uh, I mean, this is a great constituency, but that woman who drives in from the Garden of Eden, I want to tell you a little story about her. Glenda Frazier was talking with me one day in the New Glasgow Credit Union, and I think this is a real tribute to this government and the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal should be listening here. Because basically what she was telling me was that for about 20 years, 
driving in from the Garden of Eden, she could never go fast because the roads were in such desperate, desperate shape. And with this minister, there have been three projects in that strip of the Sherbrooke Highway. And she said, I met a Monte car the other day and I had to look at the speedometer for the first time because the roads are getting in better shape. So what a, 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 what a bouquet to our Minister of Transportation. Three, three, yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. It, someone has just heckled and said, we will look back in 20 years' time on that minister as being the best transportation and infrastructure renewal minister this province has ever seen, has ever seen. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I know with your wisdom you're running the House in an effective manner, but it seems to me when members stand in their place, they should be speaking on title. And I really have to question the fact, I'm listening to the debate here, we're not talking about transportation issue today, we're talking about credit unions. So Mr. Speaker, could you please rein this member in and get him on title? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. He's absolutely right, and the member, <laughs> the member for Pictou East is well aware that we're talking on Bill 76, the Credit Union Act, and uh, I suggest that the honourable member get back to the subject at hand. <laughs> the honourable member for Pictou East. Mr. Speaker, I'm into my fifth year in this House. And this is the first time I have ever been reined in by one of my own colleagues. <laughs> order, order, please. Order. The Honourable Member for Pictou East has the floor. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I was very clear that I was talking about the credit union system because it was an employee of the credit union on her way to work. So I, I apologize if I've offended anyone in the House. But, but uh, I, I, I think probably at this point I uh, will uh, take my uh, seat. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think I might get an opportunity to uh, speak in uh, reply uh, over the next few days, and uh, I'll be uh, given a full hour at that time. And uh, I know I will not be as uh, entertaining as uh, you were last night, Mr. Speaker, but I will try to at least enliven this place, which uh, doesn't get too uh, much uh, liveliness from the uh, members opposite. So uh, I, I support this bill, bill number 76, uh, fully, and I look forward to an even stronger credit union system in the future. And I am very, very hopeful that that kind, friendly service that I've experienced for 45 years will continue, uh, over 45 years, so I, I, I just cannot say enough about the credit union system in Nova Scotia. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I, I, will, I will now recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton North. Yes, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, am pleased to rise and speak to Bill Number 76, the Credit Union Act. And I do uh, welcome this act, and I do uh, echo the comments that have been made by other colleagues in the House in recognizing that uh, there are points in time when you can help processes and institutions move forward and indeed do that in a collaborative manner and one where cooperation within the region and strengthening an institution, as was mentioned by other members, has a very strong, solid uh, history in this province and indeed a proud history. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, like others, have had experiences with our credit unions and I know in Cape Breton North, both the Princess Credit Union and City Mines, as well as the North Sydney Credit Union. And the member for Cape Breton Centre was talking about some of the, the credit unions in his area and the history. 
from city mines with coal mining, but in North Sydney, when you go into the credit union, remember years ago when the branch, before its new modern facility with all the modern amenities that are in town, you'd be downtown and you'd go in with your little book and you'd be in the lineup with all the ladies and fellows with their, with their uh, nets on and the fish scales on their boots when they were in doing their business. And that was all part of the smell of money and uh, people earning a paycheck. And uh, times may have changed and shifted a bit in the community. And uh, we've actually thankfully seen uh, some of that business come back and people strengthening their credit union. And I know the member from Cape Breton Centre when he talked about uh, the Tompkins and uh, with reserve. Uh, it's actually an interesting model because I know in my time with BCA Holdings and working with, with uh, New Dawn Development and you saw the community come together and that building that's in reserve that otherwise was wondering what their future would be and, and the community came together in that very model uh, that speaks to the credit union uh, actually would have seen because I remember going in there was the credit union itself, but the community library was there, the Tim Hortons, which is a very much a community gathering point, the pizza shop, and there's program space upstairs, which was my involvement with uh, friends, of one of them that uh, the new member for Glace Bay has mentioned, uh, Mike Kelloway and others, uh, I think Neela Frazier and myself, that were working on some of the employment programs and initiatives for youth, for transitioning in the economy, and there was a space upstairs that that building had community space built into it. And it wasn't a large, nor is it a large building, but it speaks about a community supporting community while trying to provide and offer uh, a banking uh, function and for people to come together. And uh, <clears throat> so that's a positive thing. And I know throughout, as people can say, no matter where you go, and I know in Anaganish, and I always call it the Bergeron, I've been uh, Bergen, some of my people always say, uh, someone, uh, when they look at it, but there's an institution that has had very great and progressive ability and a larger banking capacity, quite frankly, uh, to use that term. And, uh, and what I do know is when we brought forward previously the Small Business Loans Program, and this is where I think we can set some of the politics aside and talk about where the strength of working together. And I remember when we brought in the Small Business Loans Program, because you'll know recently there was an announcement to expand that to allow, uh, besides new business startups, to actually allow for uh, expansions as part of that. And uh, as the Honourable Member for Inverness has stated, you know, it's good when you can look at these measures that don't cost, <clears throat> but definitely can contribute and expand opportunity to take advantage of those. And I just say, and I know the Minister of Finance, uh, in bringing this forward, he talked about looking for ideas. I remember part of the intent before with the credit union uh, loan program and the significant part providing them with a 75% guarantee. So that 25% of the risk would be uh, borne by the local community. And the part of the model was, and why people embraced it, is well, at the local community level, they knew things that quite frankly, the bureaucrats or the civil service wouldn't know if it was on a computer screen in Halifax. They'd know on the ground what the individuals, what the community history is, and know how to uh, share that risk. And what we've seen is continually topping that up adding to it and it expanding. And one of the challenges that has been there is that some, like in Anaganish, I'll say the credit union, uh, have been able to have a great uptake. Others haven't had the capacity because they've been smaller and uh, limited to the 25%. So they've been more risk adverse in taking advantage of that. <clears throat> I do know uh, one of the things we had tried to do before with Nova Scotia Business Inc. was to establish a process where the credit union business program and the CBDCs, the federally funded, the, the Community Business Development Corporations, which have a funding limit as well in place, as well as NSBI, being able to collaborate and share some of the risk and help team their efforts and resources and spread those resources to work together. And in some cases, it's proven to be beneficial. Uh, and another case that hasn't been, and I know with NSBI, there was an intent to establish a component of the lending program for smaller businesses, and that was to deal with the half a million dollars and under that uh, would be there. And I would hope, Mr. Speaker, that the Minister of Finance may look at working with NSBI, working with the Minister of Economic and Rural Development, looking at where these programs uh, benefit, and coming out of a recession, if we're truly sincere of helping smaller businesses, we do have some mechanisms at our disposal that the Minister and the Cabinet would not have to add more money, but change the existing composition of the portfolio within NSBI and work with them. So I would be, as we go forward, calling upon the government to go back. Now, we had hoped 
that that would have been a case and time moves and elections pass and things get stalled. But there is a way if we want to use within the existing pool of dollars ways to help with better outcomes, then that's something that I think we would, on the progressive conservative side, support the government in examining and looking at, support the government in bringing forward and configuring so that federal and provincial and community-based initiatives all have a place to, to be able to be stacked or partnered and outcomes can be achieved. Because we also know, and we hear it time and time again, how if you go to one of the big banks, they're going in and the only thing making a determination is a computer program. The discretion is gone from the local branch managers of the banks. I remember growing up, it was the Royal and Scotia banks in my community still have a presence, but now you go in, the bank managers don't have a capacity to offer you lending, to give you that extra discretion based upon your history in the community, based upon people's knowledge and an understanding of your circumstance, or the supports that may be there from other companies. If you're a small business and you know, if you're in uh, Port Hawkesbury, a new page is taking you on as a supplier, but you need capital, the bank screen doesn't necessarily recognize that you're not as uh, much as, as a risk and therefore you should support it. So because the traditional banks have lacked that, there is an opportunity where our credit unions are expanding into the marketplace. They have filled the void. It's been a positive uh, filling of that void. And as I say, if the Minister of Finance working with the Minister of, of Economic and Rural Development and with NSBI were to look at how do we reconfigure some of the existing programming dollars for investment, for business support, because we know that the big opportunities always come. Cabinet knows through, through the Industrial Expansion Fund, the large opportunities are always right at the door of a minister's office, the premier's office. They're being uh, presented. And often it's the smaller businesses that can benefit or aid in those outcomes that lack the same sort of mechanism or ability to get that level of attention. But there is a way to bring that forward. And that's why I think building uh, in the way that this bill does to open up the region more. As I say, uh, it's probably one of the maybe few times I'll compliment the minister on moving forward, and, uh, and I do compliment them, and I do commend the government, and we give credit where credit's due, and the credit unions deserve some credit being provided to them, and the government moving forward, and I think as we move along, we have to look at how the credit unions get over some of those voids, how the smaller credit unions may need some other mechanisms to help them work with small businesses that can't currently go into their branch and access the small loan program, how the strength of maritime and regional and Atlantic uh, cooperation can help grow the capacity of the credit union here. And if the government does that, I think they'll have done well by previous initiatives and move forward. And I know the member from Picto East had referenced before about MLA and expense and clarity, but one of the things I will agree about when you move forward is to provide the transparency. Just as much as with us as members, people can come in and see what we're doing. Uh, with a credit union, I kind of question why a person needs that many houses and that many cars, but however, that's very... Uh, Older than you. Well, yes. <laughs> yes, and maybe in a few decades I'll get there too, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I've been driving on smoother roads for a lot longer than that member always has been. <laughs> But I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, um, this is a positive thing. And what we talked about the MLA expense process was providing for transparency and clarity. But also, just as much as we as the House, as time moves on, you have to look at what the needs of constituents and members are. We have to look at the needs of communities and business. And that requires making changes from time to time. And uh, when you can do process things, as my honourable colleague again from Inverness has said, that don't cost uh, the taxpayers additional money but increase and improve outcomes then that's a good day and just as much as we uh, ourselves will have to uh, respond to the times I think we can collaborate on those things that do make improvements and we've all strived to do amongst all parties and members to do that so the public has confidence in us and we then instill confidence in the public institutions like the credit union so with that I do want to commend the minister for bringing this forward I do offer and reiterate the support of the Progressive Conservative Caucus, and I know that places like Cape Breton, where uh, I'm from, that appreciate uh, the value of credit unions and the, and the types of individuals and businesses that are supported by them, that this indeed is a good day that I think all members of the House can celebrate and collaborate with. Thank you. Honourable the Premier. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's uh, indeed a pleasure to join the debate uh, uh, on this uh, bill this evening. Uh, I wanted to offer a few uh, remarks uh, on my own behalf uh, with respect to the, the legislation, which I think uh, it's obvious has fairly broad approval from uh, all uh, quarters of the House. Uh, um, I have been uh, an active member uh, of the credit union for as long as I can, uh, uh, can remember. I started out uh, uh, with uh, what was uh, called the, the Harbour City uh, Credit Union in, in, uh, in Dartmouth. Um, and uh, it was uh, amalgamated with the Dartmouth Community Credit Union. The Dartmouth Community Credit Union amalgamated with a series of other credit unions eventually became uh, the Heritage Credit Union. And I was uh, certainly happy to be uh, a part of that uh, throughout. I, I served uh, uh, originally on what was called the Supervisory Committee and then uh, after that uh, on the uh, Audit Committee of, uh, of the Heritage Credit Union and, and did so for uh, more, than, more than 10 years. And I'm always very proud of that association. Uh, it's not just my own, it was also uh, the fact that uh, my father was involved with the, with the credit union for many years and, um, and uh, was a member of the Dockyard uh, Credit Union uh, again for as long as, uh, as, long as I, can, uh, uh, I can remember. Uh, the principles, of course, uh, associate with the credit union are a very understandable one. It's, it is uh, simply uh, that the uh, financial resources of the members of the credit union are used uh, in the local community to strengthen uh, community economic development. They, they are used to, to um, to ensure that there is uh, uh, an access to services, to local services, uh, in what we refer to now as the banking or financial services uh, uh, sector. Uh, and they have been filling that role uh, in this province for a very, very, very long time, uh, often uh, associated, of course, with uh, Moses Cody uh, and uh, much of the work that was done uh, out of uh, the St. Francis Xavier uh, extension. And, uh, and we're all, uh, many of us who have uh, over the years wanted to champion that notion of local economic development, of self-empowerment, of, of, uh, of uh, harnessing uh, the financial strength of the individuals of the province so that we can uh, move, uh, move forward um, and build the, the industry of our province, build the, the commerce and trade of our, uh, of our, com of our, uh, of our province uh, have been supporters uh, of uh, the credit union movement. The, the, um, the reality, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, uh, this uh, uh, particular uh, endeavor will, will try to uh, strengthen the overall uh, credit union central. It will mean uh, with uh, more members uh, that they can uh, or will have the financial strength to be able to provide services, a, a broader range of services, and, and one uh, would hope if they can take advantage of, of uh, the uh, uh, buying power that comes with more members that you would be able to provide those services on a more cost-effective basis. And the, the credit union is always uh, looking for uh, new ways to uh, to serve its membership. And, and in fact, uh, I would say that the Nova Scotia credit union system has been one of the most innovative uh, anyone, anywhere in the country. And, and people who have uh, been to other areas of the country would know that the Van City Credit Union is a, a very large enterprise in, uh, in, uh, in British Columbia. But um, you know, even with uh, its, uh, its size, there have been uh, innovations and things that have come out of uh, out of uh, the credit union movement in Nova Scotia that has been adopted that have been adopted in other parts uh, of the country. So, so uh, for me, uh, I see this uh, as uh, uh, the continued kind of innovation uh, and progress that we look for uh, in the credit union movement. The the, the credit union, uh, of course, has has. Uh, uh, a, 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 a very successful, it was noted by Donald Savoy, a very successful a small business program where they provide uh, um, uh, capital for uh, small business startups and, and, uh, and we've expanded that uh, relationship uh, to, a, 
to a, a, a larger extent uh, now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're, we're in the midst of a program where the credit union is going to hire people who are on uh, social services, uh, uh, social services recipients and train them uh, to take uh, good jobs in the credit union system and and these are are, are jobs that that pay well they 're not minimum wage jobs they pay well they 're jobs with uh, with pensions and 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 uh, health benefits um, they have set a target i believe this the, the current target is one hundred people that they want to bring into the system to 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 give good jobs and to uh, and to uh, strengthen their system, but also, of course, to strengthen each of the families that are associated uh, with uh, with those individuals. So, th this is this is real, le pardon me, real leadership uh, by the uh, by the credit union movement. Uh, I see this um, as a as something that we uh, would hope to be able to emulate. The more cooperation that we can have among the Maritime and Atlantic provinces, uh, I believe uh, the better and stronger we will be. Um, I've said for a long time that I believe that the success uh, of Moncton is good for Halifax and vice versa. I, I think the same with respect to Charlottetown, the same with respect to uh, Cornerbrook or St. Uh, St. John's. So these, you know, we, the aggregated market of 2.3 million people is stronger than 990,000 in our province. I think the credit union movement recognizes that. They recognize that the aggregated strength of their collective membership in Atlantic Canada uh, is, is is much greater than uh, than uh, just uh, this uh, uh, this province's membership. So I'm I'm proud of the work that, they, that they're doing, and I'm proud to be associated with it, and I'm certainly proud to support uh, this legislation. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, the Honourable Member for Annie Gonish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, too, appreciate the opportunity to rise and speak uh, in the House on behalf of this bill. Um, many of the speakers have already referenced uh, Andy Kanish and the Virgin Grand Credit Union and the history that, uh, that uh, we have with credit unions in my area, but I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's got an importance uh, uh, that uh, uh, is, is significant to, to this bill and, and, and to uh, the future of credit unions in our area. Um, Dr. Moses Cody uh, had said, give people ownership, and that really is kind of the seed or the, or the background for, out of which uh, the Virgin Grin Credit Union uh, grew in Antigonish. Um, it was an, an idea of a study group, a study club at St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, it came from that uh, originally, uh, and uh, the charter for the Virgin Grin Credit Union uh, was uh, issued in 1933. Um, it was open for business late that year, and uh, the assets at that time were $27.50. Um, and it was a, originally a credit union that was started for farmers uh, only. Uh, it very quickly uh, uh, widened its membership to, to include others. Um, a year later, uh, the assets increased to $372.85. That's when wages were $2 a day. So that amount of money in a year was considered uh, to be a remarkable improvement. Credit unions didn't begin here in, in, in Nova Scotia. Uh, they started originally in Germany uh, about the mid-1850s, around about that time. And then, of course, in Quebec in 1900, uh, the Alphonse Desjardins took up the idea for the Cas Populaire and the People's Bank. His original deposit in that credit union was 10 cents. Um, in, to, to make the connection between uh, the, the, this bill and, and, and uh, Andy Kanish and the Virgin Grain Credit Union, um, there was um, a gentleman in, in, in Boston, Mr. Filene, a millionaire. He was inspired by the development of credit unions in India. And uh, he thought that this would be a good idea for the United States. And he hired Mr. Roy Virgin Grain uh, to promote and manage them uh, as the director. Um, in 1931, Mr. Bergengren was about to take a holiday, and a little priest uh, from Andy Kanish bustled into his office, um, and that was Father Jimmy Tompkins. 
and Father Tompkins persuaded Mr. Bergengren to take uh, to forgo his. Uh, his vacation and come to Anikinish, where he spoke at St. Francis Xavier University. And together at that time with A.B. MacDonald, the Virgin Grade became, uh, they, they started uh, the legislation that was passed in 1932 that enabled credit unions to form in Nova Scotia. Uh, the, the first, uh, uh, a year later, the Virgin Grade was in operation, and the Virgin Grade was the 14th. Uh, credit union uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, it had a board of 12 directors. Three of them were women. That was back in 1932. It, the, uh, the credit union in Antikonish made its first loan in 1934. The loan was for $35. Um, they built their first building a couple of years later for $300. And the um, uh, full, first full-time manager was P.D. MacDonald, who, who continued to manage the credit union for a, a considerable period of time. By 1950, the assets of the credit union had grown to $117,000, and by 1960, it was $760,000. By 1970, it was $5 million. Uh, in 1977, uh, P.D. MacDonald passed away, and he was replaced as the uh, general manager by Mr. Uh, Ted Kogan. Um, and, the, and the credit union has continued to grow at Anikinish. Bridge & Grand now has a branch in St. Andrews, which is a community, a small community, a very vibrant community just outside of Anikinish. And as my friend from Pictou East said, Bridge & Grand has uh, joined with the uh, New Glasgow uh, credit union. So we have actually three different uh, credit unions uh, carrying the name of Bridge & Grand, all under the same umbrella. So that, that whole idea that this bill talks about, the, the joining together, uh, is something that's been happening happening in Anikinish for quite some time. Bergingen Credit Union in Anikinish now has 18,000, and this includes the three of them, 18,000 member owners. And its assets today are $177 million. Uh, so from that originally $27.50 when it started, the assets are now $177 million. Um, the, I guess the, the, the main thing to, to, to point out here is it's not just a business, a credit union. Um, it's it's a, a way, I think, of, of showing cooperation and, and, and uh, unity among uh, people in order to uh, come forward with a, with a, uh, a common purpose. Um, I guess the, the loyalty of those who have involved in the credit union over the years uh, remains its, its main asset. Uh, we have people who have been members, uh, family who have original members are still there. My own parents uh, married in 1939, became credit union members. My mom passed away just this year, and one of the things that she had said to us towards the end of her life was, remember I have an account at the credit union. She always kept $1,000 in the account because uh, the, when the, uh, this account was originally opened many, many years ago, uh, if you had a th kept $1,000 in the account, when you died, you got $2,000. Oh. And she wanted us to remember that when she, <laughs> when she was on her way. But anyway, I, I just, as I said, I just wanted to rise to speak because Andy Kanish is a, is a vibrant uh, a credit union center, and uh, we have a, a very uh, uh, viable um, uh, credit union there. It's, uh, it's well uh, uh, respected and, and, and used by, by the, the entire community. So in, in connection with this particular bill, uh, as I said, the, the, the uh, join, joining of the, the credit unions in our area to form one uh, uh, major credit union, I think, bodes well for, for what this bill is intended to uh, accomplish. When people get together, they can do great things. So thank you very much. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to rise in support of Bill 76 as well. Uh, and credit unions are, are an important part of our world, and I, I know that uh, credit union, the credit union system here in, in uh, Atlantic Canada and Nova Scotia have done a great deal of work to uh, get to this place uh, and, and to this bill. And, and I think the, uh, the minister's uh, willingness to bring this forward is a recognition of how important the system is to our economy, to the, to the welfare, and uh, and, and personal lives of, of many people in Nova Scotia, and also I think speaks to the flexibility of, of the credit union movement in adapting to the times. I, I've been a credit union member for uh, 
uh, for almost 30 years. Uh, not as long as some people here, but 30 years is a long time. Uh, and you know, interestingly for me, I, although I'm a native Nova Scotian, I became familiar with the credit union movement in, in Saskatchewan, uh, a place uh, where cooperation has been a watchword for a very long time. In fact, uh, I guess to sur for, the, for the early pioneers to survive on the, through those cold uh, prairie winters, it became necessary to find ways to work together. And uh, certainly, I, I guess they discovered that it was either cooperate or perish. And interestingly, it, it also, that, that sense of cooperation which underlines credit unions became something that was uh, very useful in the in the evolution of other important programs that we have in our world, like uh, in, in Canada, like Medicare. Uh, I, I, as a result of that experience, I joined a Mr. Credit Union in 1981, and uh, when I was living in Moncton, and became uh, during part of that time or afterwards a, a member of its board of directors, and have served on on various committees, and became quite familiar with uh, with both how successful the business could be, and with how much good it could do in the community. Uh, in the last 10 years, I've been a member of uh, Valley Credit Union, which uh, is a, a, a credit union that exists in the Annapolis Valley. It started off uh, in, uh, in Waterville in, a, in, a, in an individual's home. I can remember as a young fellow being aware that the, the credit union existed, but was always a, a little bit leery of, of becoming involved in what seemed like such a, a small operation. But, you know, the fact is, uh, the credit unions these days are very secure institutions. Uh, the, the deposits in credit unions are secured by uh, various kinds of legislated protections and uh, require, are required to have uh, certainly full investments. They provide a, a, a very wide range of, of services. Credit unions are, are I think it, maybe it, it doesn't go without saying, are owned by their members. And as a result of that ownership, they're governed by their members who uh, have, can take decisions by one person, uh, one vote. Earnings that credit unions make are shared by their members. And the earnings that credit unions make, therefore, are probably frequently used in the communities in which they exist, and they make investments in communities. They build communities through making personal loans, as some people have mentioned, the cars they bought, the houses they've purchased. I, I've been among that group. Uh, they make loans to small businesses, which may sometimes might not be able to secure loans from other kinds of financial services. They make important contributions to charities, often because the, the members of boards and the members of the credit unions themselves are highly vested in, the, in what's happening in their, in their local world. So credit unions are, are flexible and they're able to, to uh, provide many resources to close to home. A Valley Credit Union, uh, where I'm currently a member, has, has moved a long ways from that, uh, from that one house operation. There are now branches in Middleton, in Waterville, in New Minas, in Canning, uh, in Bridgetown, in Greenwood. And so uh, they've been building a very secure base. And I, you know, I think another thing that the Valley Credit Union, as many credit unions in Nova Scotia have been able to do, is to provide fa financial services for small communities that have in fact been abandoned by larger uh, financial uh, institutions. And that's become an important resource for, for those small communities. I, I'm thinking of, for example, in my own area in Kings North, of Canning being uh, one of those in particular. Um, for me, uh, and I think for its many members, uh, Valley Credit Union provides effective, friendly, personal, and personalized services. And you know, I, I just want to close by saying a, a couple of more small things, but maybe, maybe they're very big things in a, in a way. Uh, a man named Daniel Papero, uh, a systems theorist, once wrote that cooperation has, has probably been as important as competition in the evolution of our world. And uh, you know, I think uh, when, I, when I think of credit unions, cooperation is the word that comes most readily to mind. And, uh, Credit unions are all about cooperation, and uh, they're one of the great ideas we have to make uh, life in Nova Scotia better, and I congratulate the minister on having uh, brought this bill forward and, uh, and, and as one way to improve uh, the economic climate in Nova Scotia. Thank you. Thank you. I will now recognize the honourable member for Guysbro Sheet Harbour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to uh, speak in support of uh, the Credit Union ba uh, Act, uh, Bill 76. Um, credit unions are extremely important in small rural communities and areas like Guysborough Sheet Harbour. Um, 
one of the uh, one of the things that uh, certainly is important uh, to th this co or these communities that exist in this constituency is access to um, financial services. And the previous speaker uh, indicated talked about the fact that credit unions have often moved in to fill a void. And one of the good examples of that, of course, is the East Coast Credit Union, which opened its doors in Mulgrave uh, a number of years ago in an attempt to fill a void. And that organization has done a commendable job for that community and for the citizens of that, that area. Another very important credit union in uh, the constituency is the Sheet Harbour Credit Union. It again provides services especially services that are necessary for a lot of seniors. And many of the seniors in that region are members of that credit union, and that credit union just went through a significant transformation to make that uh, facility, uh, basically to modernize it and to make it more accessible for the residents, especially the seniors. Um, it's interesting, as I was uh, listening to the, to the debate, um, I was thinking about my own experiences with uh, with the credit union. I have, uh, you know, two. I have shares in two credit unions at the present time. My constituency account was deliberately put into a credit union because I felt it was important to support that that community venture. And I'm also a member of uh, four co-ops. So when I started looking at that, I have shares in four co-ops. So uh, the cooperative movement and the uh, credit union movement is very important to me. Uh, as I said, uh, credit unions have a long history in my area. And, uh, you know, the names of uh, individuals like Father Jimmy Tompkins and Moses Cody are still household names in that area. And these individuals and their accomplishments are, are very much still uh, talked about and very much uh, revered by many of the citizens, especially the more senior ones. The credit unions themselves evolved in this area out of hard times. And one of the things that happened was that as times got a little better, people moved away from some of the credit unions. But it's interesting to see that people are moving uh, back to credit unions, especially in some of the smaller areas. This bill is extremely important because it's, it will strengthen and grow the credit union uh, movement, not only in this province, but in Atlantic Canada. This will provide regions with more services, more capital, and as I have indicated, it is a step in the right direction to growing the economy here in Nova Scotia and indeed Atlantic Canada. And I would like to commend the Minister and indeed all members of this House who have gotten on their feet to speak in uh, in support of this bill because your unqualified support expresses a vision and a movement in a direction which will, I think, give us in, in, in this province um, an opportunity to move ahead and to become a leader in, in the credit union movement in Atlantic Canada. And for that, I think the minister and all members of this house are to be congratulated. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now recognize the honourable member for Lunenburg West. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it, uh, it gives me great pleasure to speak uh, just briefly about uh, Bill 76 and uh, to, uh, to show my support for it. And um, one of the disadvantages of coming uh, Kind of late in the debate is that, that most folks have uh, already said just about everything uh, there is to say about the importance of the credit union movement um, to our province. Um, my uh, colleague from Antigonish uh, traced the history through Germany, the case populaire, and right up to the present time. And uh, we've heard names like uh, Father Tompkins and Moses Cody, and uh, I won't repeat all that. I will say that uh, the Lahave River Credit Union, which is in my constituency, uh, has served the hardy folks down there, the farmers, the fishermen, uh, the forestry workers, and the businesses for many years. And if you want to know how hardy the people are in the area from which I come, I will call your attention to the East Gallery and show you that at least one of the people who came in here today is still up in that gallery. <laughs> and until very recently, so was her cohort. 
That's the kind of people that live where I come from. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I did a little research, and of course I found out that the, uh, the, the LaHave River Credit Union actually uh, started in about 1955, and in my case, and maybe this is the case in uh, some of the other um, constituencies too, it was uh, in a room of a house. That's where it started. And um, it ended up in about six or seven different places on King Street, uh, the older part of the town, and then Aberdeen Road, and now to North Street, uh, its current location. Uh, somebody else talked about um, innovation and how innovative credit unions are. And the Premier referenced one thing, and I just want to re-emphasize that, that tar the Target 100 plan, where, where credit unions are stepping up to the plate and, uh, and looking at people who are uh, on community services. Uh, the other thing is the fact that they're um, interested in amalgamating and, uh, and growing into a more solid uh, unit that will, um, will uh, better serve all people who are members of credit unions. And, um, I can tell you that in, in our town, the only financial institution in the town or immediate area that has a drive-through, drive-through banking is the Hay River Credit Union. So you can do the Tim Hortons thing, but um, at the credit union, which is uh, which is pretty in impressive. They employ uh, 11 people, and uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to simply say today, before I take my seat, that I'm uh, very very proud of of the manager. Uh, the general manager, David Fancy, um, the branch manager, uh, Ms. Cindy Vino, and the other nine employees who work there. We're very proud to have that credit union in our community. It does very good work. And uh, I'm really pleased that all members of this House have uh, supported this bill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I will now recognize the Honourable Minister of Health. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I too am really pleased to have an opportunity to say a few brief words on Bill 76, and I'd like to congratulate the uh, Minister for bringing this act forward. Um, Mr. Speaker, we heard er earlier from the member from uh, Pictou East who uh, indicated uh, his longevity as a member of the credit union. Um, but uh, I think I have him beat by about eight years, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, my grandfather um, opened a credit union account for me when I was three years old, Mr. Speaker, um, and that wasn't really yesterday. Um, so it's been, a, it's been quite a tradition in, uh, in my family, both sides of my family, really, to be uh, credit union members. My parents live in Anakinish County, and there's a, a small credit union, the Harvard Bushy Credit Union, uh, quite close to where they live. And it's, uh, it's a fantastic credit union. But, Mr. Speaker, when I uh, first uh, left uh, rural Nova Scotia and came to the big city, I became a member of the credit union uh, here in Halifax, and at that time the there were quite a number of credit unions, but there was a credit union called Halifax Metro Credit Union. And you talk about uh, credit unions being innovators, Mr. Speaker. Um, that credit union was the first credit union to have uh, an instant teller in the entire city of Halifax. And um, uh, back, in the, uh, back in the 70s, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm today privileged to have a number of credit unions in my constituency. In fact, Credit Union uh, Central um, is in the constituency of Halifax Needham. And in addition, I have Credit Union Atlantic, which is a, um, an entity that amalgamated a number of smaller credit unions, including Halifax Metro Credit Union, a number of years ago. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Credit Union Atlantic is the largest credit union um, in, the, in the province, uh, rivaled only by Burge and Gren uh, in Antigonish. And um, Mr. Speaker, we also have the INOVA Credit Union, which is becoming increasingly known um, in the metro area for its commitment to microcredit and uh, working with um, working with people who are interested in green uh, projects and uh, small development and investment. And so when I look at the, um, the credit union movement, it has continued to adapt and evolve and um, 
bring along the innovative ideas that are appropriate for the time. And I believe that this particular uh, bill that we have will really allow our credit unions the opportunity to grow and um, become, I think, even greater uh, forces for economic growth and pro prosperity in our region. And Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's really, I think, um, delightful for all of us here on this side of the House to be part of, you know, seeing that movement continue to be built with uh, some changes in the legislation that will allow them to reach their, uh, reach their capacity and their aspirations. So, Mr. Speaker, with those uh, few words, I will take my place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I am to uh, recognize the Honourable Minister for Finance, it will be to close debate. The Honourable Minister of for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank members on all sides of the House for their contribution to the debate on Bill Number 76. I think we all recognize that this is another step, another important step in the long, proud history of credit unions in Nova Scotia and indeed in Atlantic Canada. With that, Mr. Speaker, I move second reading. Thank you. The uh, question is for second reading on Bill 76. Is the host ready for the question? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Bill number 76, an act to amend chapter four of the acts of 1994, the Credit Union Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. I will now recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, would you please call Bill 78, the Public Utilities Act. Yeah. Bill 78, the Public Utilities Act. I will now recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to introduce this bill which strengthens and clarifies the role of the small business advocate under the Public Utilities Act. The bill really grows out of a personal experience that I had the last time that I personally participated in a power rate hearing. I attended that hearing as a representative of the NDP caucus when we were in opposition. And over the course of that hearing, Mr. Speaker, I learned in discussions with a representative from the Canadian Federation for Independent Business that the small business advocate position that was then in place was not working particularly well. And she explained to me what the problem was, and I thought to myself, well, we can fix that. All it takes is a bill in the legislature to make certain uh, straightforward changes, and we can make sure that the small business advocate position is as effective as it can be. So, Mr. Speaker, um, with my colleagues' approval, I introduced a private member's bill in the House. This, of course, when I was still in opposition. But the government of the day for reasons that it best understands uh, did not uh, call that bill or allow it to pass. So, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased now, as a member of the government, to introduce Bill 78 to make things better for small business at power rate hearings. Mr. Speaker, supporting small business me it means ensuring that an advocate is available to assist small business operators when uh, engaging in hearings with the Utility and Review Board. The primary interest of the small business community in front of the Utility and Review Board is, in fact, power aid hearings, which is why this is being done as an amendment to the Public Utilities Act rather than the Utility and Review Board Act. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the current provisions for a small business advocate did not allow the advocate to function effectively. First of all, Mr. Speaker, it wasn't clear who the small business advocate was representing since the definition was phrased in terms of the number of employees rather than power consumption. And so small businesses fell throughout a number of different uh, rate classes, Mr. Speaker. So it was not possible for the small business advocate in any systematic way to know who they were representing because there's no necessary correlation between the number of employees a business has 
and the amount of power that it consumes. Another difficulty, Mr. Speaker, was that the way the legislation was framed, the same person could be appointed as both the consumer advocate and the small business advocate, which created a potential conflict, an inherent conflict, Mr. Speaker, because although the interests of those two classes will often overlap, they are not always identical. And if you have one advocate representing two different interests, obviously it creates the potential of conflict. Finally, Mr. Speaker, the Small Business Community and the Utility and Review Board and others expressed concerns about the definition of small business because it was phrased in terms of a corporation when, Mr. Speaker, as many of us know, many, many small businesses are not corporations. They, many, many of them are sole proprietorships. In other words, uh, Mr. Speaker, unincorporated companies. These issues, Mr. Speaker, needed to be addressed, and we approached it collaboratively by forming a working group in 2009 with representatives from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the Utility and Review Board, Nova Scotia Power, and the Department of Finance. This group was tasked with developing and proposing amendments which would allow the small business advocate to function in an effective manner and the result of that collaborative effort, Mr. Speaker, is before the House in the form of Bill 78. The new definition will better reflect the face of small business in our province. It will allow a small business to be a corporation, a partnership, or single proprietorship. It will require the definition of small business to be established by regulation based on annual consumption of utility services rather than the number of employees and it will require that the small business advocate not be the same person as the consumer advocate at power rate hearings. These amendments will ensure the small business advocate knows who they're representing and that the small business advocate can effectively carry out their function. I'm pleased, Mr. Speaker, to tell the House that this initiative has the full support of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, as indicated in the government news release yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and in a government, uh, sorry, and in a news release from the CFIB, CFIB today, Mr. Speaker, if I may quote two short sentences from that news release, um, I would like to share with the House the observations of Leanne Hashi, CFIB's Atlantic Vice President, who said in today's news release, Mr. Speaker, quote. Now, tens of thousands of small business owners across this province will finally have a formal voice at rate hearings, and we couldn't be more pleased. Ms. Hashi goes on to say, Mr. Speaker, quote, it's important to note that small businesses are the utility's second largest customer and second largest revenue generator, so it only makes sense to have them around the table when decisions are being made that impact their operations. End of quote, Mr. Speaker, and I'd be happy to table that CFIB news release for the House, Mr. Speaker. And with that, I look forward to debate on this important initiative to better serve small business in Nova Scotia. I will now recognize the honourable member for Kings West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, pleased today to, to rise to my place and uh, make a few uh, comments on uh, Bill 78, the Public uh, Utilities Act. Uh, I, I think it is important to, to point out that uh, the bill is consistent with the position uh, of, the, uh, of the Liberal Caucus, that a small business advocate be appointed as an effective part of uh, utility hearing, hearings. We, we've had uh, a, a number of times in this House, we have advocated for this, and in fact, uh, the member for uh, Richmond and table the bill, bill number three, on the 23rd of November 2007, which established a small business uh, advocate for hearings of the UARB, and this received royal assent on the 27th of May 2008. Uh, the original bill, as the minister pointed out, uh, defined a small business as a corporation uh, with under 100 employees, and uh, that has proved to be uh, problematic uh, over the years with, uh, with hearings. Uh, it was found that the, the definition uh, in terms of small businesses that are not often incorporated, that annual consumption of utility services was a more appropriate function of what a small business should be defined uh, in this context. So in September 2009, a working group 
representatives from CFIB, uh, the UARB, NSBI, Department of Finance was created uh, to develop uh, proposed amendments uh, to Section 92, which would allow a small business uh, advocate to function uh, in an effective manner. So the amendments uh, will, uh, in essence now, allow a small business to be a corporation, partnership, or single partnership, uh, also require the definition of a small business to be established by regulation based on annual consumption of utility services. Uh, also required that the small business advocate not be the same person as the consumer advocate at power rate hearings. Uh, the minister, uh, while in opposition, uh, introduced a truncated version of these amendments. Uh, I believe uh, Bill 197, uh, Minister, do you remember that bill? Maybe you do. Uh, anyway, received first reading on October 31st, 2008. And in his private member's bill, he proposed to make it so that the consumer advocate and the small business advocate could not be the same person. He also proposed to change the definition of a small business to reflect the small general tariff rate code 10 or the general tariff rate code 11 approved by the board for Nova Scotia Power Incorporated applies. Uh, the present bill uh, defines a small business based on annual consumption of utility services to be determined under regulation. Although the regulations are yet to be completed, uh, the minister said that they have been mostly worked out. Uh, that was during the media uh, questioning on Monday, November 1st. And clarification was given by a department official uh, as under uh, 150,000 kilowatt hours per year in line with rate classes 10, 11, and 21. Uh, the present bill stipulates that the consumer advocate and small business advocate, as I mentioned earlier, cannot be the same person. And I think this, uh, this is indeed uh, a very, very strong measure that will be advanced. Uh, it's interesting uh, that, uh, not interesting, but uh, the CFIB uh, recognizes uh, the value of this chain, change and has brought out uh, a press release today indicating uh, so. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's any part of an olive branch to the, to the minister. After the minister dismissed CFIB last year, uh, when the 2% HST hike was being placed on. I think it's a case of uh, what my honourable member uh, from Digby Annapolis would say. Uh, it's simply a case of uh, uh, you can't go wrong doing the right thing. And uh, <laughs> giving small business a voice at utility hearings is indeed positive. And uh, as the minister well knows that uh, over 50% of the business in Nova Scotia uh, is small business and if this, this gives them uh, a, an opportunity uh, to be more competitive in our province and a, an opportunity for small businesses to stay healthy, uh, then uh, this is uh, indeed uh, a positive uh, move. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we indicate that we will support uh, these amendments and uh, looking, look forward to the bill going on to law amendments. Thank you. I will now recognize the Honourable Member for Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We fully understand and agree with the uh, proposal of Bill 78 and the need to support our small business community to help nav them navigate through the thicket of regulations and other hurdles they must face in to conduct their everyday business in this province. So, Mr. Speaker, it makes sense that the small business people who are really the true job creators in this province need to have their own small business advocate when matters relevant to them are discussed at the Utility and Review Board. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business has come out in support of this, and we are always cognizant uh, of the membership that that organization represents, and uh, when they are pleased, we are pleased. Um, we do hope that the person who is appointed to this position will be mindful of our province's economic situation when it comes to billable hours. And we hope that the consumer advocate, uh, that this person who's been doing a great job, if, uh, if there's less need for them now that the, uh, the small business community is going to have their own representative, perhaps some of the cost for this representative will be offset. So with that, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are supportive of this bill moving forward in this House. Thank you. I now recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. 
Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly my pleasure to be able to rise today uh, to speak on Bill 78, the Public Utilities Act. I want to thank the Honourable Minister and certainly our good NDP government for bringing this legislation forward. This is important legislation, as all of our mem my colleagues within the House have talked about, recognizing the importance of small business. The vital need for small businesses in, is, is, is everywhere in Nova Scotia. Small businesses make up our communities that we all represent. There are more, uh, gives them more chances for success. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to this, Mr. Speaker, as well from experience, but a different type of experience, uh, speaking as a former small business owner. I had the uh, great experience of owning and operating my own preschool in Eastern Passage for more than six years. I was the owner of an op uh, several small um, tenancy uh, tenant buildings, residential buildings, and as well a co-owner of a soccer retail outlet here in H HRM. So I know those challenges, or certainly have experienced the challenges that many of our Nova Scotia small business men and women are facing. The, I'm pleased to say that um, I'm, I'm, I had the pleasure as well, and it's an opportunity to thank the Honourable Minister of Community Services when I think about my experience as a preschool owner and operator of the uh, announcement that I was able to take part in, in, in positive funding for uh, quality childcare within our province. And I think that's another example of our good Nova, Nova Scotia NDP government doing good things for small businesses. Yeah. Nova Scotians... Nova Scotians who have an idea for, for small business deserve a chance to do well. They deserve every opportunity for success. Nova Scotians who have drive and passion and support around them because frankly, small business, whether it's a cottage industry, whether it's a mom and pop restaurant, whether it's a, it's a, it's a, a retail outlet within their communities, it takes more than just an idea. It takes effort, it takes support, it takes financial uh, in, input from perhaps your own personal situation. And that's, that's a big challenge. That's a big risk that families are taking and individuals are taking. It, we owe it as a government to give them every opportunity for success. Having a dedicated advocate and a voice at the table uh, at the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board will make a difference, Mr. Speaker. They know that world. They've been there. They've been part of it. As our Honourable Minister of our government has recognized and taken action for what they've heard. Without a definition of a small business, the role of advocate for function, uh, from functioning, it, without that, that definition, they were not able to... Uh, represent as effectively as they would like. This act allows that to happen. It allows our governor and council and, and ut or the utility review board to appoint a small business person, a small business advocate at those hearings. These hearings, Mr. Speaker, can ma be makers and breakers sometimes of these small businesses. Times are rough, get, but they're getting better in Nova Scotia, again, thanks to a good government that's now in place, but they still have challenges. <laughs> And taking their decisions before a utility and review board or having them to go through that process is critical to their success often. And having the voice or perspective of a small business on that board and in that process, it levels the playing field, Mr. Speaker, and it, is, it provides an equal voice, which equates to equal opportunities. The move directly reflects the input of industry groups. Nova Scotia small business, men and women spoke loud and clear. Our government, our minister, our premier is responding. The changes that all allow small businesses to be corporations, partnerships, single proprietors, it opened doors, Mr. Speaker, and it offers endless opportunities to all Nova Scotians. This is a good day, and with the support of, of this chamber, we'll see this day be even better when we can move this forward. If I ever consider taking on a small business again in a future life, I'm, no, I'm in no rush. Or perhaps if I encourage my boys to, do, to take on this type of, of uh, a business venture or constituents in my riding, just to go for it, these changes will open doors for them and allow them to be successful. Our government spoke to the people, Mr. Speaker, who are living their dreams in Nova Scotia. They took the time to get it right, and this is right, as has been said by my honourable colleagues in the, in, uh, across the uh, room.
Over and over, Mr. Speaker, no doubt my colleagues the same as I, we hear from people who are frustrated when they're trying to make their business successful and their ends meet in order to get there through their first few years. We know that it often takes the three years to get things rolling and to a st stable point. So I'm proud at this point, Mr. Speaker, having had the opportunity to be a small business person, small business owner, and now as an MLA, with the support of this, of my colleagues in this House, and certainly support of this government, to be able to call our, my constituents and tell them what good news is coming forward from this good government. We're listening to them. The public utilities hearings can be critical junctures for businesses. Changes uh, happen at the hearings. This legislation will allow the small business advocate to be a full intervener at hearings with the proper tools to truly represent the people of the industry. Separate and clearly different from the consumer advocate at power hearings, we've, we've heard. And we understand how the power hearings affect small businesses, and it can be profound and very specific to their industry. So they deserve to have a voice, someone with experience representing them. This legislation does that. I was a proud Nova Scotia businesswoman, now I'm a proud MLA. To be able to stand here in support of our government making these, making these changes, and I'm pleased to support the legislation before us today. At this point, Mr. Speaker, I'll move adjournment of, this, uh, of the bill, adjournment of debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I will now recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, that ends the government's uh, business for today. And before I, uh, I, I uh, call on the, uh, the uh, Liberal House Leader, I, I want to uh, indulge the House if I can for a very short moment here, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank uh, Mr. Don Forrestal, Deputy Clerk uh, from the House of Assembly in New Brunswick, for uh, uh, giving his time for us, and, and we were somewhat short-staffed, and he came here in short notice. And this is Don's last day, and we'd like to thank him uh, for uh, his excellent work and, indeed, uh, helping us in another uh, form of uh, maritime uh, cooperation, Mr. Speaker. So thank you. Well deserved, uh, and again, thank you from the Chair, Don, for your help in these matters in our time of need. I will now recognize the um, House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow the House will meet between the hours of 2 and 6 p.m. and following the daily routine and question period, I will be calling Bill Number 77 and Bill Number 73. Mr. Speaker, I move that we do now adjourn to meet tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Um, we, is, is the host ready for the question? All those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. We have now reached the um, hour of interruption as uh, the debate has been called earlier. Uh, the debate was put forth by the Honourable uh, Member for Argyle. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly urge this government to recognize the value of Holy Angels High School to its students and to the community and keep this school open. I will now recognize the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's with real disappointment that I rise my place today to discuss this issue relating to Holy Angels High School, a discussion that shouldn't even be taking place. Mr. Speaker, Holy Angel School is truly a landmark in Sydney. It's been part of the community since 1885 under the watchful eye of the Sisters of Notre Dame Congregation. Now, in Holy Angel's moment of need, the provincial government has turned its back on the school and the 299 young women who attend. Mr. Speaker, enrollment at Holy Angel's has remained stable and even increase this year, even in a, time, a year of uncertainty, which is a testament to the esteem the school has earned. Yes. Mr. Speaker, this is not a new issue. On December 23, 2009, our education critic wrote to the minister to outline concerns she had heard from faculty and students alike. The response, which followed one month later, 
predictably offered little in the way of detail. The minister danced around the issue and said she was receiving briefings from regional staff in the matter. Mr. Speaker, this lack of attention from the minister has proven costly. Now, Mr. Speaker, as a result of this inaction, the school is faced with the real threat of closure. This week, Mr. Speaker, the minister's department vetoed a proposal to purchase the building from the congregation. According to the board chair, a mere $750,000 is all it would have taken to save the building. That represents about $6,000, Mr. Speaker, for every year Holy Angels has provided educational excellence. It represents $2,500 per student at today's enrollment. That's all it would have taken, but they haven't done it, and these students continue to be left out in the cold. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Holy Angels School is a good news story. Yeah. In a recent Ames report, it was ranked as the top school in the Cape Breton Victoria Regional School Board. Mm. Enrollment has also been increasing for four consecutive years. In short, Mr. Speaker, this is a school in which we as a province can take pride in. At this juncture, we should be celebrating its successes and trying to repeat them elsewhere, not closing it down. <laughs> Ironically, Mr. Speaker, yesterday, there was an announcement for the construction of a new junior high school in the Premier's hometown. For the exact same number of students at the Premier's old junior high, his government is willing to spend millions, but not willing to do anything at all to preserve the learning environment for an already existing institution for a fraction of the cost. Mr. Speaker, this is old-style politics at its worst. Shame it's on shameful. It. Shame on Absolutely shameful. shameful indeed. Mr. Speaker, letters of concern from parents, 